5,730 years for a half-life of, uh, of carbon-14. So you see how the, the years kind of pile up here. For two, it's over 11,000 years. For three, it's over 17,000. And then we go on and on. And I stop again at, at five half-lives, 28,650 years. So we take advantage of these really long half-lives. And one other uh, thing. Uh, and the thing we're taking advantage of is that, is that, of course, all biological molecules are based on carbon. It has a skeleton, carbon skeleton for every biological molecule that exists, proteins, uh, DNA, RNA, everything. And the fact that every living thing on Earth has the same ratio of C14 to C12, but, not, but non-living things uh, do not. So there's a very small fraction of carbon-14 that is very consistent in every living thing on Earth, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a bird or if it's a, ca you know, a cactus, fish, uh, swamp plants, people, cats, cows, dogs, camels, people who ride camels, it doesn't really matter. So how in the world can this work? How do, how do all the living things like that have this specific fraction of carbon-14? Because the carbon-14 is, it is radioactive. Very, very, very small amount, so not enough to hurt you know, anybody, but it, it is radioactive, but it's all just about precisely the same uh, amount, no matter what type of animal or plant you're talking about. Well, anyway, this is, uh, this is how it works. So if you have a, uh, you know, all green plants all over the world are taking up carbon dioxide, and then, of course, making uh, organic compounds from it. That's glucose, but they make a lot of other stuff. And then, of course, Mr. Bunny Rabbit comes along and has uh, has dinner and then respires carbon dioxide and goes back in there. I'm sure everybody's probably had something like this somewhere in school. But it goes on further. Of course, Mr. Fox sometimes has dinner with Mr. Rabbit, expires CO2, and then going back, you know, generating more uh, plant material to feed more rabbits. Uh, and all that. And of course, there's one thing I'm leaving out of here that's actually pretty important in this, just for the sake of uh, having too much information, which is poop. There's all that's involved in there, too, uh, with regard to transfer of carbon and things like that. And then, of course, uh, everyone ends up being taken care of by what are called the decomposers, whether or not they're, you know, buzzards or vultures or whatever, or that also covers bacteria. But anyway, of course, that will generate more CO2 and going back to the plants again, which will go back into the whole system. So anyway, the bottom line on this, with everybody exchanging all this carbon, um, the fraction of the C14 compared to the C12, the percentage of the C14 ends up being the same in every living thing. So, of course, the next question is, so what? How does that help us in any way? Well, it turns out, of course, that when an organism dies, it obviously stops eating, breathing, pooping, whatever else. Anything else that would exchange carbon with the environment. So when it takes its last breath, or whatever the equivalent is in the plant world, this will be the last time it has 100% of its C14. The only way after that uh, that it can get rid of the carbon-14 is by radioactive decay. So the idea is if we measure the amount of carbon-14 in a dead, you know, a bone that you've dug up or whatever from a long time ago, then we can calculate how long it's been since it had the same percentage of carbon-14 of a living animal. So when it dies, it starts out here, but then it stays in the ground for a while or whatever and goes down and down and down. And so again, uh, the half-life of carbon-14 is a little over 5,700 years. So at the first half-life, if you happen to dig up an old bone and it happens to have, a, you know, the unlikely event, it happens to have exactly the amount of uh, carbon-14, 50% is what you would find in a living animal or plant, then you would know that it's 5,730 years old, okay? And the equally and very unlikely event that you dig up some other old bone, say a saber-toothed tiger skeleton or something, and you test it and it has, happens to have exactly 25% of the amount of the carbon-14 that you find in a living animal or plant, then you know that that saber-toothed tiger took its last breath around 11,460 years ago. And it goes on with any, you know, anything else. Obviously, I'm doing this by the more uh, drawn-out method, just by you know, dividing by two 
continue like we, like we did on one of the earlier problems. But this is just to kind of show uh, you know where we can where we can go with this. Um, so the last point out here is at 28,650 years. If you remember back at our S35, I think it was only a little bit over one year for the half-life. So again, those half-lives are um, vastly different, but they all they all follow the same math. All right. Okay, a couple of caveats, and some of them you could probably figure out already. Uh, the first one is that carbon dating can only be used on something that was once alive, uh, like a bone, a piece of wood, something like that. As it says here, it won't work on a rock, and that should be for pretty obvious reasons considering uh, what we just covered. Uh, example here, you know, these carvings were found in a tomb of somebody that apparently was very fond of moo cows. Uh, and even though there are written records from that time, their writing had been invented by that time, and a lot of this can be double-checked uh, if it happens to fall within you know, historical times. Uh, it, you know, we know from that that the trees that produced the wood that those carvings were made from, those trees died around 3,000 years ago. And again, it can be correlated a lot of times with what's in the written record. I think that's pretty, pretty phenomenal that they can do that. The other caveat is uh, it will only, in quotes, reliably date things that are younger than 60,000 years. Now, that sounds pretty darn old, but, you know, there's, there's stuff that's older. Anyway, the ratio of carbon-14 just basically peters out and gets too low. Uh, down Once it's down below about 1%, and 1% is pretty good, once it gets down below that, uh, they just can't get a good enough reading on it. There are other isotopes uh, with longer half-lives that are used for older uh, samples. So as an example here, even though this is within historical time, you can't date this statue because it's not made of anything that was ever once alive. But again, you can, uh, you know, correlate things with, with written records. So there are things that go back further than historical times. Uh, writing was invented about 6,500 years ago. And obviously there are different animals that were alive before uh, historical times that we know all kinds of things about now that we would not uh, have otherwise. Uh, and I'm always asked about this, so I'll go ahead and put a little thing up about it. I'm always asked about what about dinosaurs? Well. Uh, like, for example, the saber-toothed tiger went extinct about 10,000 years ago. And the T-Rex, the, the Tyrannosaurus, went extinct about 65 million years ago. So that's literally only about 1%. The saber-toothed tiger, was real, when they died out, it was only about 1% of the amount of time that has passed uh, between then and, and the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, but there are other isotopes that are used for dating that basically operate on the same principle. It's, a little bit different. It's really outside the scope of what we're talking about here. Uh, they use ratios of uranium and lead isotopes. Uh, but anyway, it's basically the same principle. You know from what we've seen so far that the decay curves are going to look uh, the same uh, and that you know, you'll be able to make the same sort of predictions. So just a summary of facts on half-lives and carbon dating. First is that these radioisotopes decay uh, at different rates and the, the isotopes decay depending on what isotope it is. The decay rate depends on what isotope it is. Uh, they all follow that exponential decay curve. The loss rate depends on how much of the stuff is there. So if you have this 1.0, it means 100%. Uh, so if you have a lot of it, it decays really fast. It starts plateauing out, flattening out the further you go along. Uh, the half-lives are a concept that are used to describe loss rates, uh, which equals uh, the amount of time it takes for half of something to be lost. So here and here and here. And then uh, lastly, carbon dating uses the same equations as any other type of radioactive decay. So that's how we can make fairly confident predictions that are actually often backed up uh, if they're you know, within historical time. And that is how half-lives and carbon dating work. That's it.